Welcome to lecture seven for chemistry 418 radio chemistry. This lecture is on fission. The readings for this lecture are chapter 11 from modern nuclear chemistry and chapter three from radio chemistry. The lecture covers a general overview of fission. We'll discuss the energetics related to fission. We'll see that energy from fission is much greater than the other decay processes we've discussed. We'll talk about the probability of a fission process occurring. We've already touched on this through the cross-section. We saw that certain isotopes have a high cross-section in terms of fission from absorption of a thermal neutron. We'll discuss that. We'll talk about fission product distributions, including total kinetic energy release, the mass distribution, and charge distribution. We'll talk about how fission it has a role in nuclear reactors. It's the basis of the power generation from reactors. We'll also talk about a process where the isotope decays uh, from the, through a delayed neutron emission, which can induce fission. So we'll introduce delayed neutron isotopes from the fission process. And then we'll end this lecture talking about fission that's not induced from a neutron, but proton-induced fission. Overview of the fission process provided here, where an isotope, such as uranium-235, which has a relatively high thermal uh, cross-section, uh, thermal neutron capture cross-section for the fission process. In this case, uranium-235 absorbs a neutron, goes into an excited state. That excited state has two routes of de-excitation. It can decay by emission of a photon, going back to the ground state of uranium-236, or this uranium-236 can then fission, resulting in two fission products with some neutrons. And we'll discuss the fission products, the neutron emissions, and the probabilities associated with this process, along with the energetics in this lecture. Nuclear fission was discovered by Otto Hahn, Fritz Straussmann, and Lisa Meitner, and here's a picture of Lisa Meitner, back in 1938. They demonstrated uh, that neutron irradiation of uranium resulted in some lower elements such as barium and lanthanum. They were able to perform chemical separation and show that these fission products were indeed lower elements. They were able to induce fission in this uranium due to the odd number of neutrons. When the uranium, as we showed on the previous page, when the um, uranium-235 absorbed a neutron, the, uh, that neutron that was absorbed paired with the unpaired neutron in the uranium nucleus, and that had additional energy, this pairing energy. That pairing energy wound up inducing fission. So odd N isotopes heavy odd and isotopes can undergo fission. In 1940, Georgi Fledov, who's pictured here, he was a Soviet scientist, reported that uranium-238 underwent spontaneous fission. So it fissioned on its own as basically another route of decay. Uranium-238 spontaneous fission half-life is around 10 to the 16th years. Remember the half-life for that isotope is four and a half times 10 to the ninth years. So the spontaneous fission half-life is much longer than the alpha decay half-life. Through uh, investigations, several other spontaneous fission isotopes were found. And these partial fission half-lives can be anywhere from nanoseconds to 2 times 10 to the 17th year. So the uh, partial fission half-life for uranium-238 is actually rather long. Other early work associated with fission is shown here. The first man-made nuclear reactor was demonstrated in Chicago in December of 1942. With the advent and discovery of fission, efforts were put forward to understand sustaining the fission process. We know this as the chain reaction. This occurs when the neutrons that are produced from one fission encounter a fissile isotope, fissioning that isotope, producing another set of neutrons. One can think of two types of criticality that are possible. One would be called delayed criticality, 
where all the neutrons, including the delayed neutrons from fission, which we'll talk about later in this lecture, are necessary for the sustaining of a chain reaction. This is the type of system that is exploited in nuclear reactors. Another type of criticality is prompt criticality, where this chain reaction is sustained only from the prompt neutrons, those neutrons that immediately result from the fission process. This is the type of criticality that is exploited in devices. During the Manhattan Project, studies were performed on plutonium metal to understand criticality and how much material needed to be together in order for a nuclear chain reaction to occur. The initial subcritical studies used plutonium metal, which the information on the plutonium metal was given here, a little over six kilograms, about nine centimeters in diameter. The studies were performed to determine how the configuration of the core and some surrounding materials would affect criticality. There were some notable incidents early with a pit of plutonium that eventually became known as the demon core. In August of 1945, they were using this pit of plutonium that was supposed to go into a third nuclear device, but by this time the war had ended, and there was the idea to identify conditions for supercriticality. The experiment was performed where the conditions were changed slowly, neutrons were detected, which would indicate fission, and this would drive towards criticality. In this experiment in 1945, Tungsten carbide bricks were used to surround the core. When a neutron encounters the tungsten carbide, it gets reflected back towards the core. So if you put more bricks around it, you can get more neutrons reflecting back in, increasing the fission and getting closer and closer to this chain reaction. When the experimenter was finished, put enough of these tungsten carbide bricks around the core to achieve a sufficient amount of neutrons from the fission process. While the experimenter was removing the tungsten carbide bricks, one of the bricks dropped into the plutonium core and resulted in a supercritical condition. This condition included enough dose from the fission to eventually kill the experimenter. And then with the same core in May of 1946, a picture shown here. This is not the actual picture, it was a recreation. The reflector that was being used was beryllium. A dome of beryllium was placed over the core. It was slowly lowered. A screwdriver was wedged under the dome to provide an opening, which would allow neutrons to escape. Those neutrons would not get reflected back in, so the criticality was not at a supercritical condition. Neutrons were being formed, they were being detected. The screwdriver that was holding the dome of beryllium above the plutonium core slipped. That gap disappeared. Supercritical condition was reached. Again, a dose resulting in doses and fatalities. For this reason, criticality experiments have been under high control. The, what was done back in the 40s is certainly not what is continued today. And here's an example of some current bare metal configurations used for fast neutrons. This is at the National Critical Experiments Research Center, and this is at the Nevada National Security Site. And what you see here is a configuration called flat top. And a core of fissile material can be placed inside this device and a critical configuration achieved. These neutrons that are produced are fast neutrons, and they're used to understand cross-sections and reactions of fast neutrons with a number of material, and also to understand fundamental physics of actinide isotopes. In addition to this neutron-induced fission, this thermal neutron-induced fission, uh, fission can also occur if enough energy is supplied by the particle, um, and the particle has to overcome the Coulomb barrier. So a fast neutron, neutron with the extra energy, can induce fission. That's what's shown here. Here's the neutron energy 
versus the fission cross-section, and we see for uranium-238, once we get up to uh, 1 MeV, we start to have an increase in the fission cross-section. A proton can also induce fission, and we'll discuss this at the end of the lecture. As we've already said with Georgi Florov's work on spontaneous fission, that's fundamentally similar to alpha decay, where we get tunneling through a barrier. We've already discussed that this thermal neutron can induce fission from pairing of unpaired neutrons. That pairing energy, that pairing produces energy, and that energy goes into the nucleus, which can be useful for inducing the fission. So nuclides with odd number of neutrons can be fissioned by thermal neutrons with large cross sections, as this is shown here for um, uranium-238 where we see the fission cross-section high at low energies. And this follows a 1 over uh, the frequency law for low energies. And these sharp resonance that we see in the middle between 1 times 10 to the first, 1 times 10 to the second EV, those are called resonance energies. Those are the high resonance peaks for, in this case, the fission of uranium-235. We can demonstrate some of the energetics involved in these uh, neutron pairing energies from uh, Q-value calculations. So as we see here, we can have a reaction where we take an isotope, add a neutron, we get A plus 1 plus E, or the Q-value. In the case that we see here, for uranium-235, the Q-values are shown here. So for E, we would have the 235 plus a neutron minus uranium-236. So the 235 uranium, the Q values listed here, the neutron and the 236, that's equal to 6.5 MeV. For uranium-238, the data shown here. So here's our Q value for uranium, excuse me, mass excess uranium-238, mass excess uranium-239, mass excess for the neutron, giving us a Q value of 4.8 MeV. And then for uranium-233, the mass excesses are shown here. Again, this is the uranium-233, the neutron, and the uranium-234. We see the difference is that for the isotope that does not undergo fission from thermal neutrons, uranium-238, the Q value is, is 4.8 MeV. While for the isotopes that do undergo fission, both those Q values are above 6.5 MeV. It just happens that fission requires about, the, the fission barrier is about between 5 and 6 MeV. So that pairing energy provides enough energy to uh, have the isotope overcome the fission barrier and experience fission. In the fission process, the fission products of the isotopes that we're uh, most familiar with, uranium and plutonium, undergo an asymmetric mass distribution. And that asymmetric mass distribution is shown here. This is for uranium-233, uranium-235 in red, and then plutonium-239 in blue. We see that there's a high peak, which is consistent. That mass doesn't tend to change for the different isotopes. This lower peak, we see that the peak increases with A. We have a mass distribution ratio of high to low of about 1.4 for uranium and plutonium. And these peaks, as we've discussed earlier, they're due to shell effects from the magic numbers. The peak is close to 132, which is a doubly magic 50 proton, 82 neutron, so that'd be tin 132. Symmetric fission is suppressed by a couple orders of magnitude relative to asymmetric fission. And this is all due to shell effects. Um, in nuclear reactions, this can also occur, 
Um, and this, the fission will compete with evaporation of nucleons in, high, uh, in the region of high atomic numbers. So in other words, if you make an isotope from a nuclear reaction, it can undergo fission once it's formed as opposed to de-excitation by, for instance, emitting neutrons. We'll discuss this a little bit more when we talk about nuclear reactions. So as we've seen, the location of the heavy peak pretty much remains constant for the uranium isotopes and the plutonium-239. We see the lighter peak increasing. We can also see an influence of neutron energy, as what's seen here. This is for the uh, 235 uranium fission yield with a uh, difference between thermal neutrons and 14 MeV neutrons. The obvious change is that as we increase the energy, this middle section, the yield, goes up. What we're seeing is that we're kind of washing out some of the shell effects with higher energy. As we've already seen for uranium-233, uranium-235, and plutonium-239, the fission yield distribution actually varies with uh, the fissile isotope. With the previous isotopes, we mentioned the uranium and plutonium isotopes, that fission yield distribution was rather small. But we can imagine, as what's shown here, as I start to increase the mass of the uh, fissioning nucleus, the heavy curve remains constant and the light continues to increase. We can imagine eventually that, uh, particularly if we get at a close where z is equal to 50, so z being equal, uh, excuse me, where z would be equal to 100, so that the fissioning isotopes would have a z of 50, which is here, fermium is a z of 100. You can imagine that here we'd start getting a symmetric fission. So if we look at Fermi, uh, fermium, as the mass of this fissioning system increases, the location of the heavy fission peak uh, will start to coalesce with the light fission peak. And we can see areas on this curve where we're plotting n, the number of neutrons, against the mass of the fission fragments for the different z is plotted here. These are the different isotopes. We can see that those in the circles here are all symmetric. So we can definitely understand that uh, the fission distribution is actually a function of, we've already shown it's the energy, but also the fissile isotope that's undergoing fission. Another aspect of fission products is how they are distributed. We've already talked about the yields being different, but even within a yield for a given isobar, for instance here, the data is for A of 141, we have yields that can be either for specific isotopes, those are the independent fission yields, or the data that we see in the chart of the nuclides, the cumulative fusion, fission yields. For the most part, we've been working with the cumulative fission yields, which is an integration of all the independent fission yields for a given isobar. Um, as we can see, the independent yields need to be determined for specific nucleides. These can be difficult to determine, especially with radionuclides uh, fission products that are relatively short-lived. Um, the data for both the independent and cumulative fission yields can be found at this web page listed here. You can find that uh, you'll see that there's actually a relatively sh smaller amount of independent fission yields available. So the difference between the independent fission yields are shown here where there, you have the dots on the line, and the cumulative fission yield is just the integration. And the cumulative fission yield, those are the data points that are available to us in the chart of the nuclides. Let's discuss what happens with the nucleus during the fission process. Now we're exploring two types of fission, spontaneous and induced. For spontaneous fission, which we see here, this occurs from the ground state of the nucleus. Modeling this spontaneous fission can be 
similar to how one models alpha decay, where for the spontaneous fission to occur, there must be tunneling through a barrier. And this is one of the reasons why half-lives for spontaneous fission tend to be very long. This isn't completely true, but generally speaking, for most isotopes that undergo spontaneous fission, the half-lives for this process are long. Those that have a shorter half-life, such as Californium-252, are exploited because they have a relatively large spontaneous fission branch. Other routes that include this tunneling are shown here. One is isomeric fission. This can be thought of analogous to the decay of a gamma from an excited nuclear state to de-excite, except for this process, the excited nuclear state undergoes fission. And we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail later in this lecture. There's also sub-barrier fission, where the nucleus is at an excited state, but not quite over the fission barrier. Now, there's processes where the interaction with the neutron can cause the excitation of the nucleus so that it overcomes the fission barrier. And this can occur through neutron capture, either through a thermal neutron for those nuclei, particularly those that have an unpaired neutron, where that pairing energy is enough to bring the nuclear energy over this fission barrier, or the addition of a fast neutron. So the neutron from a fast, which means high energy, adds that energy to the nucleus so that fission can occur. Thermal neutrons can induce fission in uranium-235, but a thermal neutron will not fission uranium-238, but a fast neutron will fission both those isotopes. During the fission process, the nuclear Coulomb energy decreases during this deformation. And we can see here kind of a schematic of how the nucleus deforms during the fission process. Eventually, the nuclear Coulomb energy decreases during deformation. The nuclear surface energy increases. This change of the shape eventually induces a saddle point. And at the saddle point, the rate of change of the Coulomb energy is about the same as the rate of change of the nuclear surface energy. This causes an instability in the nucleus and results in its breakup. If the nucleus deforms beyond this point, fission occurs. And when two highly charged deformed fragments are in contact, the Coulomb repulsion between the particles accelerates these fragments to 90% of their kinetic energy within 10 to the minus 20 seconds. So overall, we can see that there are a few different routes to fission, and we can explain those through the energy levels of the nucleus. Fission products are neutron-rich fragments from the nucleus, and since being neutron-rich, they tend to decay by beta emission. So those neutrons tend to get converted into protons. However, there are some areas of the fission products where um, these decays actually result in the liberation of a neutron. This occurs when there's an isotope that'll decay that has a Q value say around 5 MeV, in this case iodine-137. This is from the a table of the isotopes. It's part of the mass parabola for 137. We have the data here. We see that iodine-137 has a Q value of 5.8 MeV. And the daughter, the xenon-137, the data shown here, there's this SN value, the neutron separation energy, and it's at 4 MeV. So this Q value is enough, this energy is greater than the neutron separation energy. So you can imagine that if iodine-137 decays to a state that's above the neutron separation energy in the xenon, as opposed to emitting a high energy photon 
the xenon can de-excite by emission of a neutron. And that's what this bar here indicates on the table of the isotopes, that this isotope will decay through neutron separation. And you can see that this is a delayed neutron. So the whole process is called delayed neutrons from fission products. So um, these particles, the reason that we have this energetics is that as the particles decay from an excited state down to a ground state, they go to more spherical forms. Um, generally, they'll give off prompt neutrons. The neutron will take away about 5 MeV. When, when first form, those fission products, non-spherical, quickly emit a neutron, go to a spherical state, form a radioactive isotope. And then they tend to uh, decay by this beta process. However, certain regions, as we see here, iodine, 137, uh, 139, and the bromine isotopes, 87 to 90, can decay through this uh, delayed neutron process. What we see is the occupation of a higher energy state and the emission of a neutron. The xenon, 137, for example, its Q value is 4 MeV, and the neutron separation energy of the daughter, cesium-137, is 8.2 MeV. That's not energetic enough. Same thing for the cesium-137 decay. It's a little over 1 MeV, and these neutron separation energies are close to 7 MeV. Now, this may not seem like a, a large fraction of neutrons. It's a little under 1% of the total neutrons from fission are these delayed neutrons but it provides uh, an important control of the reactor processes because these neutrons are delayed. As opposed to a neutron being emitted promptly after the fission process, for instance, iodine, this neutron has a half-life emission rate that's on the order of the decay of the iodine-137, which is around, around 25 seconds. Other examples of isotopes that decay by neutron emission are shown here. As an example, arsenic-87 can decay to an excited state of the selenium-87, emit a neutron. Selenium going to the bromine, same thing. Bromine going to krypton, same condition. Krypton going to rubidium, not enough energy. The krypton is only at 3.8 MeV Q value whereas this neutron separation energy is close to 10 MeV. Bromine 90, Krypton 90, same thing. So the key, if you were to look at data from the table of the isotopes, is this dark bar with the N that indicates neutron emission. And again, one of the trends is that neutron separation energy, for this case, is generally on the order of 5 MeV, and the Q value is obviously greater than that value. And as we mentioned in the previous slide, um, this is, these delayed neutrons are important for maintaining chain reaction control in a reactor due to this half-life component, though two seconds may not seem like a very long half-life. That emission of the neutron is much longer and it's delayed compared to the prompt from the fission process. The reason these delayed neutrons are important has to do with the fact that how fast the fission process is. About a tenth of a millisecond is needed for, um, a, for a neutron from fission to react. So fission occurs, that neutron is born, that neutron then reacts with another isotope. One needs to have somewhat tight control on this because even if you went for a tenth of a, tenth of a percent of an increase per generation, and you, went, you would have a 10% increase in 10 milliseconds. So you still need 100, you would basically need 100 generations for that, but it happens so quickly that uh, 10 milliseconds, you could quickly add 10% more energy, 10% more heat to a reactor without this control. So these, days, these delayed neutrons, they all have half-lives much greater than 0.1 milliseconds, 
So that allows even this small fraction a means of having a little bit more control over the fission process. Now we mentioned that for uranium-235, uh, about 0.75% of the neutrons are delayed. And for uranium-233, it's about a quarter percent, and same thing for plutonium-239. This means in some regards, uranium-235 is a better fuel for reactors, just to, it, as an example in regard to uh, these delayed neutrons. Now fission products also produce, uh, they also have another influence on fission. This is, you can call it kind of a positive influence on fission. It gives off some neutrons. But there are some fission products that influence reactors because they absorb neutrons. In this example, the production of xenon-135 uh, fission product has a, this isotope has a very large neutron capture cross-section, three times 10 to the sixth barns. Buildup of this isotope in reactors can actually poison the reactors and shut down the process in regards to the fact that the buildup of the xenon-135 means that this isotope then increases and with the increase of that value those isotopes are capturing more and more neutrons because of its cross-section. Some more detail on neutrons and fission in reactors are presented here where we see that the probable neutron energy is a little under an MeV, while the average energy is a little over, is about two MeV. This is actually used in fast reactors since two MeV neutrons are certainly high enough to fission non-fissile isotopes like uranium-235. The only thing you would need to do is construct a reactor where, uh, for a fast reactor where the neutrons are not moderated or slowed down that would mean high Z reflector and coolant, which is not a high Z. So they often use sodium as a coolant or even lead and bismuth. Thermal reactors need to slow down the neutrons. So they'll use water, for example, as a coolant. Anything with a lot of protons, a lot of hydrogen, graphite carbon, that can be used to slow down neutrons. And one thing the uh, as we discussed in the previous slide, that the power of a reactor is proportional to the number of available neutrons. The neutrons come from uh, the fission process that creates the energy, so the number of neutrons available is a rough measurement of the number of fissions that occurred. There's a factor K, which is a multiplication factor. It's the ratio of fissions from one generation to the next. And here we've plotted multiplication factors as a function of burn-up on this slide here, or as another k-effective term as a function of years. And one thing they would like to do in reactor systems is have a k-effective, which is fairly constant over time. Once you get a k-effective below one, um, you are no longer able to use that as fuel. In fact, you want a k-effective really of one. You want the ratio of fissions from one generation to the next to be nice and steady. So they actually uh, configure the reactor material, put things like burnable poisons into the core. Burnable poison is just an isotope that will absorb the neutrons and eventually be used up through the fission process. And here an example of those K effective terms. As you see that they vary uh, around one for both these figures. Something else that occurs in the fission process is damage. Um, the very fact that these particles are being emitted damage uh, materials and fuel within reactors. Um, the fission process itself, the fission products recoil about 10 microns in UO2, and there's a very high local temperature, almost 3,000 degrees C in 10 nanometer diameter within the fuel. Two of the types of irradiations that can, uh, the damage that can occur from the radiation, one is swelling, which is shown here. There's a cube. Swelling is where the axes of each side of the cube increases. And then there's something called creep, where there's no volume change, but shape change. Both these types of damage can occur in reactors. So there's actually um, a good deal of new research focused on trying to find materials that are um, impervious to swelling and creep as a function of neutron damage.
the energetics of the fission process, and that's what drives nuclear fission, but it's also um, something that we can use to evaluate which isotopes will fission and which ones won't. Fundamentally, any nucleus with an A greater than 100 um, can split into two approximately e equal size with the result with the result with resulting energy. However, why do we only see fission at about 230? Because the separation of a nucleus is hindered by the Coulomb barrier. You could treat this barrier as penetration, what the particles would have to um, overcome in order to form two particles from a nucleus. So if we could figure out the energy from fission and compare that to the Coulomb barrier, we could evaluate the difference and find out where this uh, fission is possible. So we would actually have to have the fission overcome the Coulomb barrier. It just turns out around uranium, both these quantities have values close to 100, 200 MeV. So the Coulomb barrier is close to 200 MeV. Fissioning is close to 200 MeV. And once the fission energy is above the Coulomb barrier, this uh, event can occur. For comparing Coulomb barrier and uh, fission energies, we can use our generalized value for the Coulomb barrier. Here we have the two equations. We'll use this equation for the calculations. And all we're going to compare is the, Q, is the Q value for fission versus the Coulomb barrier from the calculated fission products. So here we assume a symmetric fission, uranium going to two palladiums, plus some energy. The Q value is 190. MeV and the Coulomb barrier is 175. Again, for this symmetric fission, which we know doesn't occur, we see that this is energetically favored towards fission. Let's evaluate something more realistic, asymmetric fission. So we have uranium-238 going to barium plus, plus lanthanum. The Q value is, for that reaction is listed here, of 175. The Coulomb barrier is 164. We see that both these values result in fission. The realistic case we need to consider shell effects. However, fission, we can also see that if there was not the shell effects, fission would actually favor symmetric distribution without the shell effects. The energetics would be more favorable. As an example, um, at 200 mercury, has a Coulomb barrier of about 165 MeV uh, between uh, selected fission fragments, while the fission energy is around 140 MeV. So this obviously, the fission energy is less than the Coulomb barrier. Mercury 200 is not expected to fission. The fission barrier um, is lower for uranium when compared to the mercury, so fission occurs at this point. The Coulomb barrier height increases as we go from something like mercury to uranium, increases more slowly than the increasing energy of the fission. And for this reason, spontaneous fission is only observed among the heaviest elements because the barrier for that spontaneous fission is lower. Generally, half-lives um, for spontaneous fission decrease rapidly with increasing C. And here we see two figures where this demonstrates the half-life generally decrease with increasing Z. Here, as we go from thorium, uranium, plutonium, curium, californium, on to element 104, we're plotting the uh, half-life versus Z squared over A. But we see that as we go heavier in uh, atomic number, higher in atomic number, heavier in mass, uh, for given elements, we tend to see a general trend. However, for a given element, for instance, if we evaluate fermium, if we go to two, uh, 258, from 244 to 258, we see that at 248 and 244, approximately the same, very short half-lives, and there's a high half-life peak at around 250. And this is trend is repeated for the other elements. Here's another example of how we see the half-life change as a function of neutron number. 
for elements paired, I mean, grouped into their, ele uh, for isotopes grouped into their elements. And we definitely see this trend as we go from uranium down to element 108. We see a definite decrease in spontaneous fission half-life. Fission can also occur through isomeric states. We talked about isomeric states with gamma decay. We, these often result in metastable state isotopes where the isomeric state is above the ground state and de excites to the ground state with the emission of a photon for gamma decay. For fission, it's possible to have an isomeric state which will decay by splitting in two. And these tend to be very short, nanoseconds to microseconds, and it's, it's a competitive process with fission. You can basically think about this, uh, these fissioning isomers are states with these second wells. So here's a primary well, here's a second well. The isotope can sit in this second well. The barrier that it has to tunnel through to fission is now much less for the isomeric fission than the spontaneous fission. Um, and for that reason, um, the shape of the nucleus will change. This is why these isomers are also called shape isomers. And this exists because the shape of the isomer is different than the ground state uh, nucleus. These fission isomers, there's about 30 of them known. They occur around uranium to berkelium. And this can be induced by neutrons, protons, deuteriums, and alpha particles. They can also result from decay. So it's possible to have one isotope decaying to a fission isomer from a parent decaying to the fission isomer in a daughter state, and then that daughter state undergoing fission. So here's some examples of the uh, fission isomers. We can see that americium-243, the isomeric state is high enough where it's at, at 2 MeV, which is enough energy to get over this fission barrier. So that would be something in this figure at the top. It would be living in an area where the energetic, would, the energy would be high enough to penetrate this barrier to fission and then go through isomeric fission. What is seen is that if one evaluates the saddle points, so a first saddle point, or, and this is an evaluation, uh, the figure on the bottom left-hand corner shows energy above the first well for the first saddle point, so that would be this energy, and then the energy above the well for the second saddle point, which is shown here, that's, excuse me, that's the second well energy, and then the second saddle point energy is shown here. We see that there are changes in these trends. The well, the second well point, does not tend to change as a function of isotope. However, the relative height of the first and second well does change. This figure here shows what would happen to the nucleus, how the nuclear shape changes as it moves from one point of this fission isomer to another. So you can imagine that getting into this fission well definitely lowers this barrier, as we showed in the previous slide. The area that uh, the the area that needs to be penetrated to induce fission is much less compared to um, the first well condition. A final example of fission has to do with that that's induced by other particles besides a neutron. And here we have an example of proton-induced fission. We see a fission mass distribution for the reaction of thorium with a proton that re produces this fission product. And here, the fission product distribution for the reaction is a function of energy. And what we see is that the excitation, there's a definite influence on the fission product distribution with energy. So we see we go from 13 MeV protons to 53 MeV protons. We start off at 13 with a what looks like a typical uh, two-humped fission distribution, as you would expect for something like thorium based upon the shell model. We're all the way at 53, 
we see that we get symmetric fission, which tells us um, that the ground state, uh, lower energies, is really uh, dictated by the shell model. And if we can overcome the shell model, we tend to see symmetric fission. And the amount of energy put into the system by the proton, 53 MeV, is enough to help overcome the shell model and allow symmetric fission product formation. This lecture on fission described some important components related to the fission process. One, we described the mechanisms of fission, what occurs in the nucleus during the fission process, how the fission uh, occurs and is driven by a distribution of charge in the nucleus, and that eventually the Coulomb barrier is enough where it overcomes the binding of the nucleons together and inducing a very energetic reaction producing two excited fission products. And these fission products can excite through the emission of a neutron rapidly, de-excitation by emission of photons, and the formation of fission products. We discussed the types of fission reactions that can occur. One is induced by particles. The most common one that people think of are neutron-induced, particularly thermal neutron-induced reactions, as you see in reactors. Those have high neutron capture cross-sections for the fission process. We've explored on the chart of the nuclides how to determine, how to utilize these values. Uh, we've also, in this lecture, showed that fission can be induced by charged particles, proton-induced fission. You need to have an energetic system uh, because the proton carries a charge. You need to get over the Coulomb barrier of the nucleus. We talked about spontaneous fission, where fission is just another decay process that competes with other decay processes. Spontaneously fissioning isotopes are in the high and heavy end of the chart of the nuclides. We talked about the energetics of fission, relationship between the energy, the Q value, and the Coulomb barrier. When the Q value can exceed the Coulomb barrier, fission can occur. Generally, this needs to be in a regime on the order of 200 MeV for the Q value. We talked about the probability of fission. One should remember both cumulative and specific yields. So the cumulative yield, which is also provided in the chart of the nuclides, is for a given isobar, where specific yields are for specific isotopes. And then finally, uh, from this lecture, you should understand something about fission product distributions, the, particularly the mass distributions, how they're primarily asymmetric at uranium and plutonium, but they become symmetric as the mass of the fissioning isotope increases. This is driven by magic numbers of the fission products, particularly uh, tin 132, doubly magic uh, with a Z of 50 and an N number of neutrons of 82. And we also discussed total kinetic energy release. There's other aspects of fission that we, per, uh, that we discussed in this lecture uh, that one should understand uh, and helps explore and explain what occurs in the nucleus during the fission process. Here are some questions that you should be able to answer based upon the chapter. Again, these questions uh, may show up on the quizzes. So one would be compare energy values for the symmetric and asymmetric spontaneous fission of uh, amory CM242. An example of this for uranium isotope was presented in the lecture. So what one would do is compare the Q values and the Coulomb barriers. So for the Coulomb barrier, we could use this equation, which is just related to the uh, Z of the two fission products and the A of the two fission products. And all this says is what sort of charge uh, one would have to, uh, one would find due to the Coulomb repulsion if the two fission products were just touching and assuming that they're spherical. So if we want to do a, the other thing we need to do is talk about the fission of amory 242 and evaluate symmetric and asymmetric. Well, symmetric means splitting in two, so 242 divided by two is 121. So we pick two isotopes with an A of 121. And here for this example, I've selected silver and cadmium 121. 
I've calculated the Q value through the Q value calculator here. It's a little over 200 MeV. The Coulomb barrier is uh, 182 MeV, and the difference is 28 MeV. So that's enough energy to obviously overcome the Coulomb barrier. For a symmetric uh, fission product distribution, I chose one fission product being cesium-137, a common fission product, and from that the remainder would be zirconium-105. Evaluated the Q value for that, again 203 MeV. The Coulomb barrier using this equation, a little under 180. So the Coulomb barrier is lower for the symmetric. The Q value is also lower. And the Q value is lower by a greater amount, so the overall energy is less. Nominally, one would state that uh, fission should occur through symmetric fission because you get more energy. However, one has to overcome the, um, the shell model, the fact that the nucleons want to arrange themselves in shells. This is one of the reasons that with a high energy particle, as we saw with proton-induced fission, if you add enough energy to the nucleus, one can overcome the shell effects and then fission through a symmetric route becomes more probable. Okay, other questions. What's the difference between prompt and delayed neutrons? Well, prompt neutron uh, from fission means that the fission products, as soon as they're formed, they de-excite by the emission of a neutron. So that's a channel in which very it's a very short time frame, as the name encourages prompt, as the fission product is born, it emits a neutron to de-excite and goes to the ground state. Whereas in the delayed neutron, what we saw we have a condition where a fission product decays to an excited state of a daughter. And that daughter can de-excite uh, through the emission of a neutron. So there's only special regions where that neutron is bound with sufficiently low energy where it can be emitted through de-excitation. And what's the difference between induced and spontaneous fission? Well, that's uh, what we demonstrated on the very first slide of this lecture. Induced means a neutron comes in, changes the A of that isotope, so uranium-235 absorbing a neutron goes to uranium-236, that excited state of uranium-236 fissions, where spontaneous fission is just another decay route. And uh, as we saw that Flerov was first investigated, spontaneous fission of uranium-238, where the uranium-238 decays by fission as a competitive route with alpha decay. And then finally, what influences fission product distribution? Well, there's a few things, the energy of the neutron and the target itself. Continuing with a question that was shown on the previous slide, you can compare the Coulomb barrier and Q values for the fission of isotopes of lead, thorium, plutonium, and curium. If you see a question like this, you could select which isotopes you would want to use. So you could use isotopes that are along the stable or more stable line. Um, and the trend would be that you would see differences in the value, in the, in the, in the value for the Q, uh, the Q value and the Coulomb barrier, and particularly the difference between those values as you increase from lead to curium. The fact being that as one increases in Z, that barrier um, difference in, uh, increases. Therefore, fission increases in probability. You can describe what um, occurs in the nucleus during fission. And that's basically demonstrated in this figure where we have a nucleus that deforms. We reach a point, particularly here, where we form the saddle. We have two sections of the nucleus that have large positive charges. At this point, the Coulomb repulsion between these char charges overcomes the uh, near-term interaction of the nucleons forcing the fission products to form from this nucleus. And as this breaks apart, the nucleons that are in this neck will slosh one way or the other towards the nucleus. We form these two deformed energetic fission products. They can immediately uh, emit a neutron to de-excite. A neutron can also come from this neck. And through the de-excitation, they'll reach a more stable state. They will be the fission products, which tend to undergo beta decay. You can also compare um, energy from the addition of a neutron of two isotopes, for instance, in this case, 242 and 241 americium. Which isotope is likely to fission from the addition of a neutron? That's actually a separate question. Um, we know that neutron-induced fission 
is prominent with odd number of neutron isotopes. Americium um, has an odd number of protons. So americium-242 has an odd number of neutrons. We would expect that this would have a um, more likely fission due to the addition of a neutron. And we could verify this by looking at the cross sections for the uh, for, for the fission cross section for the NF reaction. And we would see that the americium 242 indeed has a much larger cross section in comparison to uh, the americium 241. Finally, uh, another example would be provide calculations showing why plutonium-239 can be fissioned by thermal neutrons, but not plutonium-240. The same concept as before, the odd number of neutrons. And this is similar to an equation that was demonstrated in the lecture for uranium isotopes. When you have completed the lecture on fission, please comment on the blog and respond to the lecture seven quiz. From this lecture, you should be able to explain why the distribution of fission products is asymmetric in mass, and why this changes as the mass of the fissioning isotope increases. You should understand the different types of fissions that were discussed, and this includes neutron-induced reactions, and really focus on why the odd number of neutrons in the nucleus that is absorbing the neutron and undergoing fission allows the fission process to occur. You should also understand spontaneous fission, the process where the nucleus undergoes fission without the reaction of a neutron. And we did discuss how this modeling is similar to alpha decay. You should be able to discuss, comprehend, and utilize cumulative and independent fission yields. You should be able to broadly describe what happens to the nucleus during the fission process. You should understand and identify how delayed neutrons are emitted from fission products. Given a mass parabola, you should be able to identify which fission products can emit a neutron to de-excite. This is the delayed neutron. You should understand how fission properties are used and influenced in nuclear reactors. This includes the role of delayed neutrons. You should also understand what is a desirable neutron multiplicity in reactors and what that neutron multiplicity means. And you should be able to broadly speak about some types of damage in reactors from the fission process. You'll be expected to calculate energetics related to the fission process and primarily compare Coulomb barriers and the fission Q value. Through these comparisons, identify which isotopes would be expected to undergo fission. You should understand that spontaneous fission half-lives generally decrease rapidly with increasing Z. You should be able to comprehend trends and systematics in proton-induced fission. There was a discussion on fission isomers, and you should be able to basically understand that as in gamma decay, isomeric states can exist in which fission is a decay mode.